Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Georgina Simons. Georgina, an effervescent and determined escort, inhabited a world steeped in affluence and grandeur. Yet, beneath the veneer of sophistication and splendor, lurked a labyrinth of falsehoods and manipulation, ultimately leading to her premature demise. She was always fascinated with her appearance, and this preoccupation intensified over time. Seeking more space for their family, Georgina, Pete, and Emily found a small terraced house and moved in, enjoying a steady income and financial security. Money was not a concern for them. Pete found success working in the electric vehicle industry, while Georgina, feeling unsatisfied with her nine to five job in the loan industry, sought alternative career paths. She confided in her friends, expressing her belief that the traditional nine to five workday was not a good fit for her. Eventually, Georgina began supplementing her income by working as a burlesque dancer in a bar and later for an escort service. Both roles appealed to her due to the attention they provided. However, it was during her tenure at the agency that her life took a significant turn. In May 2012, at the age of 20, Georgina crossed paths with Peter Morgan, then 49, a well-to-do real estate developer who lived near where she resided. Peter led a life of affluence, happily married to Helen and a devoted father to their two children. His wealth originated from a multi-million pound property portfolio, which notably included a stately windmill situated on a sprawling 300-acre estate that he shared with his parents and brother. Peter's childhood was marked by early exposure to farming equipment and machinery. By the age of 10, he had become adept at operating tractors and motorcycles. Opting out of formal education, he remained within the family business until the age of 34, indulging in a lifestyle where money was of little concern. Peter acknowledged a singular lapse in judgment, an encounter with a sex worker in Amsterdam, but otherwise maintained his dedication to his marriage. However, a perceived midlife crisis in his 40s led him to use technology such as smartphones to engage with sex workers through escort agencies. In his own words, Peter appreciated the transactional nature of his encounters, describing the appeal of being able to have sex, shake hands, and leave. However, everything shifted when he crossed paths with Georgina. She stood out from the others, unexpectedly captivating Peter's heart. Before Georgina, Peter had been frequently visiting different sex workers, with the encounters becoming weekly over time. While overseeing the renovation of a lighthouse for his real estate ventures, Peter showered Georgina with lavish gifts, including a Range Rover worth over $112,000 and an $11,000 shopping spree. He even paid her $1,000 for a single night together. Georgina enjoyed the attention and luxurious lifestyle but exclusivity in her relationship with Pete remained elusive. She continued to see other clients while maintaining a romantic relationship with Pete. Unlike her arrangement with Peter Morgan, he harbored deep resentment towards Georgina's involvement with other individuals, despite their lack of romantic commitment. By 2015, he had persuaded Georgina to work exclusively as his personal escort providing her with monthly payments ranging from $7,000 to $10,000. During this time, Peter was overseeing the renovation of his grade two listed castle, including Castle Bungalow, a cottage on its grounds where Georgina relocated as part of their arrangement. She resided in the cottage over time. Peter confided in Georgina about his emotions and aspirations for the future. He decided to end his 22-year marriage to Helen ensuring her financial stability while allowing Georgina to retain occupancy of the cottage. This turn of events left Pete's former partner and father of their daughter devastated, feeling as though he had lost the woman he loved. In August 2015, the couple embarked on a trip to Africa, yet Pete couldn't shake the feeling of Georgina slipping away from him. The thought of her being with other men, particularly someone as affluent as Peter Morgan, plunged him into a deep depression. 
Despite understanding Peter's ability to provide Georgina with a lavish lifestyle that made a strong impression on her, Pete felt powerless in comparison to Peter's wealth. Pete's mother, Lynn, reflected on this time, noting that at this point, Pete was happy to be with her, and he earned enough money for them both to have a good life and do what they wanted. She thought he put up with a lot, as she never knew anything else was going on. Morgan occupied a significant place in his life. He was constantly on his mind, and the feelings were intensifying within him. However, Pete cared too much about his mother to talk about these issues. On November 15, 2015, Pete Deem vanished following a heated argument with Georgina regarding text messages. Tragically, he was later discovered deceased by hanging in a wooded area. Two days later, Alexi Butcher, a friend of Georgina's, succinctly summed up the situation. Rich Pete was completely smitten. He loved and cherished her, envisioning a future together. However, it seems Georgina was only interested in him for his wealth. It is doubtful that she ever truly cared for him, even though she claimed to have left poor Pete for him. Her intentions were always to exploit rich Pete for as much as she could before returning to poor Pete. Adding to Georgina's distress, she had lost her father to suicide just a few months before Pete's death. Despite the hardships she faced, it was clear that she genuinely cared for Pete, like many others did. However, she would have to confront the devastating realization that her own actions contributed to his untimely demise. The news of Pete's death deeply affected Georgina, causing a significant shift in her personality. She blamed Peter for Pete's passing and became increasingly intolerant of his obsessive and controlling behavior. Furthermore, she held Peter accountable for having to deal with social services regarding her daughter's well-being. Georgina publicly criticized Peter in front of his friends and family, which angered him. Peter was frustrated that even with Pete gone, he could not have Georgina entirely to himself. Later, he would recollect that Georgina had almost succeeded in terminating her own life by slashing her wrists in the bathtub. Peter recounted that she was submerged in the water and he pulled her out. Following the demise of her former partner, she was regularly consuming drugs and alcohol. She held him accountable for Pete's death, making him feel culpable and asserting that it was entirely his fault. Tensions between Georgina and Peter Morgan escalated further after Pete's funeral in December 2015, when Georgina began dating Tom Ballinger, a friend of Pete's. Enraged, Peter started taking Georgina's phone to read her texts. He had also planted a listening device disguised as a white plug adapter in the cottage, making a total of 514 calls to it, allowing him to eavesdrop on every one of her phone conversations. One night in January 2016, Peter overheard a conversation in the bugged cottage that shook him to the core. Georgina was confiding in Tom Ballinger about her scheme to blackmail Peter into relinquishing the cottage. She disclosed her intention to relocate to London, where she could pursue her escorting career and significantly increase her earnings from upscale clients. Upon hearing this, Peter's heart sank grappling with the realization that Georgina might not be committed to their relationship. She issued dire threats of exposing damaging information about him to the public, convinced she could ruin him. Georgina alleged that Peter concealed $50,000 in cash at home to evade taxes and was involved in constructing buildings that failed to meet code standards. Furthermore, she claimed to possess evidence on her phone indicating that Peter engaged with sex workers while still married to his wife. After three years of dating Georgina, Peter was aware of the explicit photographs and videos documenting their participation in group sexual activities, as well as intimate moments in the marital bed at his residence. He also knew that Georgina had successfully blackmailed at least three of her former clients. The realization that Georgina posed a serious threat to his reputation and livelihood left Peter with no choice but to consider extreme actions to protect himself. Fearing the catastrophic consequences of Georgina's blackmailing tactics, Peter considered eliminating her as a solution. 
He carefully planned this by meticulously creating a detailed list of necessary items using the Notes app on his iPhone. On January 12th, 2016, Alexei, a friend of Georgina's, contacted the Welsh authorities. Later that same day, Alexei and Georgina made plans for a play date for their daughters. However, Georgina failed to arrive to pick up her child from school, as arranged. When the police arrived at the cottage, both Alexei and Georgina's mother were present along with Peter. Peter informed the officers that Georgina had been struggling recently, turning to alcohol and drugs to cope with the grief of losing her father and ex-boyfriend Pete. He expressed concern that Georgina may have harmed herself, speculating that she could be in the woods behind the home. Despite a search of the area, Georgina was not found. Due to her mental state, authorities classified Georgina as a high-risk missing person. In the end, Peter admitted to the police that he had intervened and taken Georgina's phone from her, fearing she intended to use it to arrange a drug transaction. Furthermore, information gathered from Georgina's family and friends revealed that Peter was deeply infatuated with her, whereas she viewed their relationship solely as a business arrangement. Alexei informed the authorities that Georgina had decided to terminate her association with Peter and was looking forward to the future. Peter was brought in for questioning after the police located the phone. After prolonged interrogation, he eventually confessed to strangling Georgina and burying her body on the property. Law enforcement officers found Georgina's remains concealed beneath farm machinery, bound with rope and with an orange string tied around her neck, indicating she had been strangled. Georgina's handbag, vehicle, and house keys were discovered discarded in the trash, along with her high heels. Additionally, the police uncovered Peter's listening device, which he claimed he had installed to ensure Georgina's safety. However, call logs for Peter revealed that the listening device had been utilized 514 times between 2015 and 2016. Ultimately, Peter justified his purchase of the listening device by claiming he believed Georgina was exploiting him. He alleged that he had overheard Georgina discussing plans to blackmail him into surrendering the cottage. Peter carefully compiled a shopping list on his phone as a reminder of the items he needed to purchase, which included a polytarp, a handle, snips, string, tape, gloves, a plug, and a bag, tools later used in Georgina's murder. Furthermore, the police obtained footage from the farm's security system that captured Peter's arrival and exit from the vehicle, as well as the concealment of Georgina's body. The authorities speculated that Peter was unaware that his wife had installed the cameras after his departure on January 14, 2016. Peter was formally charged with murder, and his trial began on November 28, 2016. During the trial, he pleaded not guilty. The prosecution argued that Peter's obsession with Georgina led him to meticulously plan and carry out her murder. In contrast, Peter's defense asserted that his Asperger's disorder impaired his ability to fully comprehend the consequences of his actions, which could mitigate his culpability. Despite testimony from two doctors, the prosecution's expert disagreed with this assessment. Ultimately, the jury found Peter guilty of murder on December 21st, and he received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 25 years. In October 2017, Peter filed an appeal against his conviction and imprisonment. However, the appeal was dismissed in March 2018. The unexpected death of Georgina deeply affected her family and friends, plunging them into deep grief. Her vibrant personality, now a treasured recollection, stands as a poignant reminder of a life cut short by this tragic event. The community came together in a display of unity, offering sincere support to Georgina's family and friends as they grappled with their sorrow. Their steadfast presence served as a powerful testament to the resilience that can be found in the collective strength of a community facing hardship. Though Georgina's life was tragically short-lived, her legacy continues to live on in the hearts of those who cherished her. May her memory inspire others to savor every moment and appreciate the preciousness of life. 
Lisa Maria Kaiser was born in 1994 in a large family where her eight siblings also grew up. It was a large but far from prosperous family. Parents were busy with their own problems and did not show love and care towards their children. Moreover, there were rumors that abuse and violence were rampant in the family. The story in question unfolded in the year 2020, at the very time when the whole world was consumed with the fight against COVID-19. In one corner of Ecuador, quietly and unnoticed, truly terrible events were unfolding. Here, in the small parish of Pifo, on the northeastern outskirts of Quito, the protagonist of this tragic story was born and raised. Lisa Maria Kaiza, a woman with an enigmatic gaze whose life story became a true Ecuadorian nightmare. On that unfortunate Tuesday, October 27, 2020, Lisa sent several messages to the father of her children, David. They were words full of despair because their paths with David at that time had already almost parted. In these lines, she confessed her love for him and her unexpected new pregnancy. However, in subsequent messages, Lissa wrote that life was losing its meaning for her, and the decision to terminate the pregnancy was inevitable. Throughout the night, Lissa pleaded with David to come to her, but his refusal was resolute. His parents also urged him to stay home, and David took their advice. In the early morning hours of October 28th, neighbors in Lissa's home heard a faint cry for help. Looking out the window, they found a woman lying on the floor with signs of vomiting. The neighbors rushed to help her, immediately calling emergency services. The doctors and police arrived and found Lissa in a critical condition, but still alive. After administering first aid, she was immediately hospitalized. However, in the house, her children, a girl of five and a boy of nine, were found unconscious. The doctors were unable to help them. Their little hearts had stopped beating at that point. Authorities learned the identity of the children's father and contacted David Acosta, who upon learning of the tragedy, immediately arrived on the scene accompanied by his father. He was informed that Lissa was in the hospital and his children were found without signs of life. After several days of fighting for life in the hospital, Lissa finally regained consciousness. By that time, the investigators, guided by their findings, had presented the prosecutor's office with sufficiently convincing arguments to issue an arrest warrant for this mysterious woman. When she was released from the hospital, she was immediately transferred to a social rehabilitation center. The authorities insisted that Lissa undergo a psychological and psychiatric evaluation as her state of mind required further investigation as part of the upcoming trial. Lissa ended up in a rehabilitation center and doctors and psychologists took up their work. In a conversation with a criminal psychologist, Lissa opened up about her difficult childhood where her parents fought and abused each other and their children. Her childhood had a noticeable impact on her state of mind and moments of quarrels and her parents' divorce became an integral part of her memories. Such a childhood forced Lissa to go to work from the age of 11 to be able to study. The girl strived to escape from her dysfunctional family and build her future in a different way. The expert report also indicated that Lissa had been abused. She talked about how, after several years of marriage, David, her husband, changed dramatically. He began to humiliate his spouse and then to raise his hand against her. On the day of the tragedy with the children, investigators working at the scene found several glasses with liquid residue on the table. These finds later revealed traces of epilepsy pills belonging to one of the children, as well as other chemicals requiring identification. Police officers thoroughly searched the house, and after noticing a strange odor in the kitchen, noticed a suspicious area under the utility room. They broke down the barrier and found a lifeless body wrapped in a blanket with characteristic signs of having been there for a long time. Later, Further investigation revealed that the discovered body belonged to Jaime Yanchaguano, a 28-year-old who had been in contact with Lisa. Jaime had been reported missing by his family days before the gruesome discovery. According to Rosa Yanchaguano, Jaime's sister, he was last seen on October 18th. Rosa told investigators that after her brother disappeared, Lisa called several times inquiring about him. Lisa claimed to have received a text message from Jaime 
where he mentioned that illegal substance traffickers were holding him captive and demanding a ransom of $8,000. She strongly warned Jaime's family not to contact the police. This claim became a crucial point in a complex investigation as detectives sought to solve the tragedy and uncover if there were any other hidden victims. During her interrogation, Lisa revealed that in 2020, while working at a cookie factory, she met Jaime Ian Chiguano. According to her, they became friends. Lisa wanted to return to her husband, who allegedly planned to blackmail Jaime for money. David made it clear to Lisa that if she did not help him, he would divorce her. Later, David gave Lisa a white powder and told her to put it in Jaime's food. Once she did, Jaime fell asleep and never woke up. Realizing what had happened, Lisa, in desperation, tried to win back her husband, but failed. In her despair, she ingested the same poison and gave it to her children. However, the poison did not have the expected effect on her, and she sought help from her neighbors to save herself from the horror that had befallen her children. Following her testimony, investigators launched a thorough investigation, but no evidence of David's involvement was found. No one close to the couple could have foreseen that Lisa Maria and David Acosta's lives would take such a tragic turn. When they met, Lisa was only 16 years old and still in high school, a dreamy and romantic girl, while David was a strong and determined young man. Their friendship quickly developed into strong feelings, leading to Lisa's unexpected pregnancy. Although their families disapproved of their relationship, David's parents supported their son and welcomed Lisa into their home. In difficult times, David's family provided genuine support to the young couple, even inviting Lisa to live with them to ensure she completed high school. When Lisa turned 18, the couple got married. Two years later, they were expecting their second child, a daughter. David's parents decided to provide the young couple with their own home, giving them an apartment where they found a corner of family happiness. However, over time, their relationship began to deteriorate. Both spouses were unfaithful, leading to mistrust and disappointment. Their once boundless love began to weaken. Lisa also complained of psychological abuse from David, prompting her to seek help from the police. Eventually, she was granted a protective order, forcing David to leave the family home. At this point, Lisa began to blackmail David, demanding money for the chance to see their children. In early September 2020, Lisa's life took an unexpected turn when her eldest son began suffering from seizures. In desperation, she took him to the emergency room at Baca Ortiz Hospital. After stabilizing his condition, doctors conducted tests and diagnosed a focal form of epilepsy, a severe condition affecting a specific part of the brain. Doctors advised Lisa to undergo further tests, including MRIs, and to consult specialists urgently. However, Lisa ignored these recommendations. A month later, her son suffered another seizure and they returned to the emergency room. Reviewing his medical history, doctors discovered Lisa had not followed their earlier advice, failed to complete tests, and had not seen specialists, leaving her son without necessary treatment. They warned her that continued neglect could lead to legal consequences. Despite the warnings, Lisa disregarded the medical advice. A few weeks later, after her son's condition resurfaced, she called David, who was alarmed by her serious tone. She informed him that a social worker would visit to discuss. To brighten the waiting time, Lisa offered him a drink. However, as David drank the drink, he suddenly felt unwell. His condition was worsening and the social worker had not shown up. So David decided to go home to get something to deal with his discomfort. The next morning, David woke up in a terrible state. He could barely speak because his tongue was numb. Every step caused discomfort and his eyes hurt. His parents insisted on calling an ambulance. David was taken to the hospital where he spent several days. Tests revealed the presence of a psychoactive substance in his system. But given that he hadn't used anything of the sort, David began to speculate how this could have happened. Eventually, he speculated that perhaps someone had deliberately slipped him some substance in a public place. David was grateful for his life 
and realized that what had happened could have ended much worse. In early October 2020, Lissa made the decision to hire a nanny for her children. Her cousin Patricia recommended her friend Bertha, a responsible 48-year-old woman looking for work. On Monday, October 5th, Bertha arrived at the young mother's house. Lissa urged her to take a pill that she said helped prevent infection with the COVID-19 virus, an epidemic of which was at its height at the time. Claiming that it was a highly effective natural remedy, Lissa convinced Berta to swallow the medicine and enter the house. They sat down to discuss the babysitter's childcare duties. A few minutes later, Bertha began to feel sick. She felt a headache. Her stomach began to upset, and eventually she vomited. A short while later, Patricia showed up. It turned out that she had called her cousin repeatedly, but Lissa didn't answer, which alerted Patricia. She decided to check what had happened and immediately went to her house. Upon entering, she found Berta lying on the couch, who was practically fainting already. Lissa shared with her cousin what had happened and expressed concern. Learning that Lissa still had not called an ambulance, Patricia immediately did so herself. After a while, doctors arrived and sent Berta to the hospital. The condition of the victim managed to stabilize. Doctors diagnosed poisoning with a toxic substance, which often happens when using various medications. Doctors decided that Bertha did not tolerate some component of the composition of the pills from COVID-19. A few months before this tragic incident, in June of the same year, Lissa's former buddy, Mark Escanto, had died of poisoning. At the time, the cause of his death had gone unnoticed. But now, given all these strange circumstances, Mark's case required additional attention. Investigators scrutinized the deceased's home and found Lissa's fingerprints on the glasses used the night before Mark's death. This fact added new evidence to the investigation, pointing to Lissa's possible involvement in the incident. But suddenly, a new accusation was made against Lissa. Her own family made a shocking report to the police. It turns out that on September 2nd, the family had a family gathering where Lissa offered to let everyone taste a drink of her own making. Seven brothers and sisters of the young woman, as well as their parents, drank the unknown drink and immediately felt sick. Fortunately, no one died, but the 56-year-old mother suffered a stroke. Lissa's father claimed that while the relatives were seeking medical attention, his daughter stole $1,300 from the house. Now the investigation included not only crimes against the children and a former boyfriend, but also an incident that jeopardized the lives and health of her own family members. As it turned out, that wasn't all. Investigators encountered another strange event. In May of that year, Jose Luis Erazo, a friend of Lissa's, was found dead in his home. A few days before, Jose had suddenly disappeared, and neighbors soon smelled a rotting odor, prompting them to contact the authorities. An examination of the body initially revealed nothing suspicious and was ruled a heart attack. But one of Jose's sisters suspected something strange and hid a bottle of alcohol found in the refrigerator. In addition, Jose's family noticed that some items were missing from the house. It turned out that Lissa and Jose were friends, and when the guy died, the alleged killer contacted his relatives by phone. With a distraught voice, she stated that Jose owed her a large sum of money, and she had to contact the family to repay the debt. This cunning plan did not work, and a little later Lissa called Jose's family again, changing her voice to conceal her identity. Identifying herself as Jose's friend, she claimed that she was pregnant by him and now had to apply for child support. Although Jose's family did not believe these stories, Lisa was not about to give up and made a third attempt to deceive them. She said she knew who was responsible for Jose's death and offered to meet to uncover the details. Had she not been arrested on charges of killing her own children in Jaime, the list of victims might have gotten longer. When the media reported the arrest of Lisa, who had poisoned three people, Jose's relatives understood. They immediately reported their suspicions to the authorities, and Jose's body was exhumed for forensic examination to determine the true cause of death. The relatives were not mistaken. Traces of poison were found in the remains of the deceased. On December 22, 2020, a hearing was held for Lisa Maria Kaiza for the murder of her two children, whose names and photos were classified, and for Jaime Yanchaguano. 
The trial was conducted virtually due to restrictions related to the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Lissa had been in contact from a social rehabilitation center. The prosecutor's statement said that Lissa gave her children a toxic mixture of insecticides and anti-epileptic drugs. In interrogations, she claimed that she had grown desperate and could not leave her children with her husband, David, who did not care for the children. In fact, she admitted that she wished them dead. At the end of the hearing, the judge issued the defendant a court pass and ordered her remanded into custody pending trial. The children's trial next took place in 2021 at the Pichincha Provincial Court. The prosecutor presented a set of evidence to prove Lissa's guilt. Among them were statements by David, who revealed the content of messages the wife had received on the eve of the tragedy. In one of the messages, she claimed that she would take with her what belonged to her, referring to the children. She said she didn't know where her children and herself would go, heaven or hell. But now she felt as if she was in hell. Lissa added that she doesn't expect her husband to forgive her because she knows he hated her and now he will hate her even more. David also spoke about his unstable relationship with his wife. At the hearing, the defendant's reconstructed testimony was presented, stating that she took two pills that day, called for help, and then passed out. According to the reconstruction conducted by the prosecutor's office, the daughter died while still in bed, and her older brother tried to take a few steps to call for help, but fell and died. The conclusion of the forensic medical examination was extremely clear. The children died as a result of a premeditated crime. The deaths were the result of suffocation caused by pulmonary edema and intoxication caused by a mixture of epilepsy medication and other unspecified substances, presumably insecticides and disinfectant. The prosecution also charged Lissa with the death of Jamie Ianchiguano, whose body was found bricked up in the kitchen. The perpetrator was also suspected of attempting to kill David and members of her own family. The hearing raised the issue of Lissa's irresponsible attitude to her son's health after being diagnosed with localized epilepsy. The mother ignored instructions for further tests and follow-up examinations, and when the boy was hospitalized again, his condition was exacerbated by her own mother's negligence. Warnings from medical professionals did not change her attitude toward her son's treatment, leading to a threatened termination of her parental rights. Lissa's mental health investigations revealed her to be highly emotional and environmentally dependent. She sought constant attention and understanding from others and experienced severe anxiety when events did not unfold according to her plan. She also exhibited a tendency to self-harm. She attempted to say goodbye to her life at least three times, but was unsuccessful each time. Witnesses described her as insecure, attachment-seeking, exhibiting schizoid and erratic behavior, the findings of the psychological analysis also emphasized that on the day of the tragic events, Lissa acted with full awareness of her actions. After a long trial that lasted 10 months, Lisa Maria Kaiser was found guilty of the crime against her children. The Pachincha Provincial Court sentenced her to 34 years and eight months imprisonment. In addition to this, she was ordered to pay David a compensation of more than $20,000. It was noted in the press that Lisa remained calm throughout the proceedings and only showed emotion when her children were mentioned. The Jaime Yanchaguano murder case, which began in August 2021, appeared to be unfinished. New details were revealed during the court hearings. Lisa admitted giving her friend a white substance mixed with alcohol, but claimed she got it from David. However, the investigation proved otherwise. According to a psychiatrist who interviewed Lisa, she did not want to take Jaime's life. She wanted to intimidate his family so she could then extort money. She did demand $8,000 as ransom. Experts called the plan disorganized, which ultimately led to the crime. In addition, forensic tests revealed that it wasn't that simple. Jaime was found to have poison in his system and the cause of death was strangulation. The body was found with a shattered rib cage and wire around the neck. Lissa claimed that after her friend died, she decided to bury him under a back room and cement him in. The store owner's testimony confirmed that Lissa bought building materials during the days of Jaime's disappearance. After the party's arguments, the prosecutor's office requested a new trial in April 2022. At that trial, an additional charge of extortion was filed. Lissa called Jaime's relatives, 
claiming he was being held by a group of gangsters and demanded $8,000 for his release. The defense relied on the lack of conclusive evidence that Lissa was involved in Jaime's murder. Nevertheless, she was found guilty and received a 22-year prison sentence, as well as a sentence to pay $5,000 to the victim's mother. While Jaime's trial was underway, the investigation of Mark Escanto and Jose Luis Arazo, Lisa's alleged victims, was nearing completion. Mark Escanto was 48 years old, and tests conducted after his death revealed traces of the same substance that Lisa had given to her children. In addition, Mark was found to have severe inflammation of the stomach. The family's lawyer claimed that Lisa met Mark, offered him a beer, and then put the poison in the drink. A glass with Lisa and Mark's fingerprints, as well as a swab containing the woman's DNA, was provided to authorities. Alleged motives for the murder included jealousy and money. It is also known that Lisa had asked Mark to help her financially, and there is evidence that he loaned her at least $120. Mark was Lisa's first known victim. The final outcome of this case, as well as that of Jose Luis Arazo, remain unknown. They may not have been reported in the press, or the investigation may not yet have reached the stage of being formally charged and brought to trial. At the time of her brutal crimes, Lisa Maria was only 26 years old. Her high-profile criminal case has become one of the most horrific and disturbing in Ecuador's recent history. These crimes made her known throughout the country as Doña Venado. Lisa Maria Kaisi is recognized as a serial killer in Ecuador. Her victims have endured terrible suffering, and their relatives have suffered unbearable pain. The charges include five murders and nine attempted murders. Under Ecuadorian law, the maximum sentence she could face is 40 years in prison. That means Lissa could be released when she turns 70 years old. It is still unclear what motivated Doña Venado to commit such horrific acts. Was her act the result of resentment for not getting what she expected in life? Many speculate that the motive was money, and in David's case, Lissa acted out of a lust for revenge, which led to the tragedy with her children. The most horrific part of this story is not only the number of victims left in the path of Doña Venado, but also the fate of two innocent children who could not have guessed that their mother, who gave them life, would take it away so absurdly and cruelly. Lynette White was a, Lynette White was a beautiful young woman from Cardiff, Wales, who was doing what she believed she had to do in order to get by. She dropped out of school and had been working as a prostitute since she was 14. Being a sex worker wasn't part of Lynette's childhood dream. Weeks before she was found dead, Tim Rogers, a BBC Wales journalist, interviewed her while investigating child prostitution. During the interview, she told Tim how she was drugged, taken to Bristol by a gang of men, and forced into prostitution. Yet even after Lynette found her way back to Cardiff, she could not find her way out of prostitution. By 1988, Lynette, who was now 20 years old, was working the streets daily as a prostitute. Described as popular and pretty by friends, Lynette was probably the most visible prostitute working in Cardiff at the time. She was the first girl to be out at lunchtime and would be the last to leave at night. Working every day, rain or shine, even on Christmas, earning 100 pounds per night. One would almost think White was working hard to have a better life. But that was not the case. It was all to pay for her boyfriend, Stephen Miller's cocaine addiction. Every night, Miller took 60 to 90 pounds from Lynette, who was his only source of income. Lynette lived with Miller in a flat on Dorset Street in Cardiff. Each day, Miller would drive her to Riverside in Cardiff where she worked and meet her later in the evening at the North Star Club to collect her earnings. It continued like that every day until February 9th, 1988 was the last day Miller saw Lynette. She had not made contact with Miller or her friends in the days leading up to her death, which was very odd behavior for her. She was also due to make an appearance as a witness for two prosecution trials when she disappeared. No one knows the reason why White stopped contacting others five days prior to her death. 
The police thought she was deliberately hiding to avoid giving evidence and began to actively search for her. Earlier that same month, Leanne Vilde, Lynette's friend, had loaded Lynette her keys to a flat for the purpose of taking clients there for sex. On February 14, 1988, in the evening, Leanne, who probably wanted to use the flat, went there but found it locked, which was quite unusual. Lynette was nowhere to be found. Leanne became very worried about Lynette. She drove to Butte Town Police Station to report her friend's disappearance. She returned to a James Street flat with three policemen who were expecting to serve an arrest warrant on Lynette and take her in. The policemen forced entry into the apartment and found Lynette lying there in a pool of her own blood. A missing witness fell dead with massive injuries. Who murdered Lynette White? According to the autopsy performed by pathologist Bernard Knight, Lynette had been stabbed over 50 times on her chest, face, stomach, wrist, breasts, arms, hands, and inner thighs. Her throat was also savagely slit from ear to ear. Though she was stabbed multiple times, the autopsy revealed that Lynette died from the throat injury. The pathologist also determined that Lynette was murdered on February 14th between 1.45 a.m. and 4 o'clock a.m. Lynette's body was found between the foot of the bed and the window, covered in blood. A zoospermic semen, which is semen containing no sperm, was found in her vagina and also on her underwear. There were two different blood types found on Lynette, her own blood and an AB type blood, which did not belong to Lynette. Soon the news about Lynette's death had spread and police began to ask questions about the incident. Witnesses told the police that they saw a man looking distressed in the area where Lynette's body was found on James Street. The man looked very suspicious and he appeared to have blood on his hands. The suspicious man, described as a white male, approximately 5'8 to 5'10, and in his mid-30s, became the primary focus of the investigation. Efforts to find this man were exhaustive. Soon, they arrested a man that matched the suspect's description, but he was soon released after Police looked into Miller, Lynette's boyfriend, as the partner of a murder victim is usually the first obvious suspect. Miller was questioned but later released because his blood type didn't match the one found on Lynette. Because Lynette was supposed to appear as a witness against a man named Francine Cordell in court, Francine and his mother were investigated, but soon the two were eliminated as suspects because their blood also did not match the AB blood type found on Lynette. Very little is known about the case against Cordell or the other case that Lynette was set to give evidence in. Another suspect that piqued the investigator's interest was a man who was on the list of 12 persons of interest in the area due to their past criminal activity. He was a sex offender and a pedophile who lived close to James Street. His identity was concealed and he was called Mr. X. When Mr. X was interviewed, he admitted to paying Lynette for sex in the past and was unable to account for his whereabouts at the time of the murder. Mr. X had blood type AB, which prompted the police to run a DNA test on him. When the results came back, it eliminated Mr. X from the investigation. Now, all that the police were left with were statements gathered from their door-to-door -door inquiry. Gromick, who lived in the flat right above where Lynette was murdered, together with his friend Atkins, gave statements implicating each other in their accounts. But as the statements contained four completely different accounts, the investigators didn't take it seriously. Ronnie Williams, a police informant, also gave an account implicating his common-law brother-in-law, Yusuf Abdullahi. He initially claimed Abdullahi knew the killer and later implicated him directly, saying Abdullahi was the killer. It was known to the police that the two detested each other. So again, investigators dismissed the account. Leanne Vilde, who reported Lynette's disappearance on the day she died, was also suspected and questioned. The police visited her daily to question her. The pressure was becoming too much for her to handle, and one day, while she was drunk, she named Miller and Abdullahi as the killers. Violet Perriam, a secretary at the Cardiff Yacht Club, also gave a statement about the incident. 
eight months into the investigation. She came forward claiming that on February 14th, while driving home from the club at about 1.30 a.m., she saw four excited black males outside the building where Lynette was killed. She then identified two of them as John Acti and Rashid Omar. Perriam's statement would give the case a new direction. Angela Sela, who is mildly mentally retarded, also gave a statement that she saw Miller, John Wishid, Ronnie Acton, John's cousin, Tony Paris, and Tony Brace outside 7 James Street on the day Lynette was murdered. This was exactly what police needed, as her account corroborated Perriam's statement. Further implicating Abdullahi, John, Miller, and the rest were Gromick and Atkins, who gave new statements on the same day with Selah. They said they also saw a group of men, including Ronnie and Abdullahi. Selah then gave another statement in December 1988 that she heard a scream from Lynette's flat and rushed there with Vilde. Coincidentally, on the same day, Vilde also told the police that she went to the flat after she heard Lynette scream and met Miller, Abdullahi, Ronnie Acti, Miller's brother, and an unnamed mixed race man. Unfortunately for Sela, she had an AB blood type. Police insisted that her blood was found on Lynette's socks. She then gave a new statement, but she was part of the killing together with Vilde and the other guys. Vilde also admitted that she was forced to cut Lynette's wrist to ensure her complicity and silence. Miller confessed to killing Lynette after 307 denials. He also implicated the other men maimed, which led to the arrest of all the men allegedly involved in the murder. On December 7, 1988, the police arrested Stephen and Tony Miller, Youssef Abdullahi, Rani Akhti, Rashid Omar, and Martin Tucker. On December 9, 1988, John Akhti and Tony Paris were also arrested. For close to a year, they were locked up until their trial began on October 5, 1989 at Swansea Crown Court. This trial became the longest murder trial in British legal history, lasting 197 days. After spending two years in custody, Ronnie and John Acti were acquitted of the murder, while Tony Paris, Stephen Miller, and Youssef Abdullahi were found guilty. Each were sentenced to life imprisonment and since then, they're known as the Cardiff Three. Even though no forensic evidence linked these men to the crime scene, they were held as the criminals. However, there were a lot of doubts and questions about the convictions. Consequently, the friends and families of the Cardiff Three began a campaign to overturn the convictions. The campaign received massive support and was followed by television documentaries in 1992. By December 1992, the Cardiff Three's appeal was heard. After the Court of Appeal had listened to Miller's interrogation, Lord Taylor said the police had bullied Miller during the interview. It ain't all in my father's room. I'm not involved. I'm vegan. I'm not involved. Oh, why is it 70 but you I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they put in for. Therefore, the truthfulness of Miller's admission was irrelevant. The card of three were free at last. Their convictions were declared unsafe and unsatisfactory by Lord Taylor. But if the card of three didn't commit the crime, it means the real criminal was still roaming free. It brings us to yet the same question. Who murdered Lynette White? Eight years later, the case was reopened. This time, Professor Dave Barkley and Chief Superintendent Kevin O'Meal were assigned to the task. The case took the officers back to the crime scene. By then, it was already 12 years since the incident happened. While examining the old crime scene photographs, Professor Barkley's eyes caught something that no one else saw in all these years. It was a large drop of blood believed to have been thrown from a knife onto the wallpaper. When the crime was committed in 1988, police removed lots of wallpaper in the flats to be stored as evidence. Upon searching through the old wallpaper evidence, they discovered that the only missing piece of wallpaper was the one that contained the large drop of blood. The forensic scientist didn't give up though. He continued to study the crime scene photos and realized the blood could have dropped on the skirting board beneath. Underneath several layers of paint, 
the team found the blood completely sealed in and dry. Traces of the blood were also found on a piece of cellophane wrapper from a cigarette pack. Since then, the detectives and scientists dubbed the suspect Cellophane Man. The forensics team, led by Angela Gallup, got to work. But shockingly, the DNA profile was not found in any of the 140 police databases. But when the police searched for similar profiles, it was narrowed to just hundreds in the Cardiff area. Using the approach of familial DNA searching, a partial match was eventually made with the profile of a 14-year-old boy. This boy was known to the police as he was once arrested for joyriding in Cardiff. But could he be the cellophane man? If you thought about his age, then your guess was right. He wasn't even born when the incident happened. At that time, the case was 15 years old. Notwithstanding, the police had to visit his house. When they got there, they were told that the boy's father was dead, but he had an uncle, Jeffrey Gifford. On February 26, 2003, detectives pulled up at Jeffrey's home, a semi-detached house in the village of Lanharan, 15 miles west of Cardiff, but no one was home. The following day, they checked at Jeffrey's place of work, an office block in Cardiff city centre where he worked as the security guard. When the police explained the reason for their visit, Jeffrey said, Oh, I thought you got some guys for that. He was asked to provide a mouth swab and he complied. Immediately, police checked the swab. They had finally caught the cellophane man. Chief Superintendent Kevin O'Neill was determined to do things right this time. He put a surveillance team on Jeffrey while he made preparations for the interview. Chief O'Neill had plans to put surveillance on Jeffrey for a whole week, but on February 28, 2003, Jeffrey made a crazy move. The surveillance team spotted him at a garage where he bought three packets of paracetamol, an over-the-counter pain reliever. By the time the police got to Jeffrey's house, he had taken about 62 paracetamols. Jeffrey denied ever taking those tablets, but he announced, just for the record, I did kill Lynette White. I've been waiting for this for 15 years. Whatever happens, I deserve it. I sincerely hope to die. He was taken to the hospital where he told a staff member that he was being watched because of a murder he committed 15 years ago. Jeffrey was prepared to die as he initially refused to be treated. He eventually agreed to take an antidote. Within a few days, he had recovered. On July 4, 2003, Jeffrey pleaded guilty to Lynette White's murder and the judge, Justice Royce, sentenced him to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 12 years and 8 months. Jeffrey's barrister said Jeffrey killed Lynette over 30 pounds for sex. He said Jeffrey wanted his money back when he changed his mind. In February 2007, Atkins, Sela, Vilde and Gromick were charged with perjury. By December 2008, Sela, Vilde and Gromick were found guilty and sentenced to 18 months of imprisonment each. Atkins was exempted because it was believed that he was believed threatened, abused and manipulated to admit to false accounts suggested to him. In March 2009, it was announced that there was enough evidence to prosecute the police officers involved in the initial investigation with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. In 2011, the trial collapsed due to missing evidence. In 2015, Eight of the 15 charged officers cleared of perverting the course of justice launched a high court civil action against the force, suing for malicious prosecution, false imprisonment, and misfeasance. But at the end of 2015, the judge in the civil action dismissed their case. The five falsely accused men were compensated after their release. Stephen Miller was paid 571,000 pounds. John Acti was paid 300,000 pounds while Tony Paris was paid £250,000. Rowan Acti died in 2007 after much struggle to cope with what had happened to him. Yusuf Abdullahi also died in 2011 of perforated cancer. He too had battled with post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's it on the Lynette White case. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. The case of Kristen Rossum.
She could have been a scientist, but she chose a different path. Blonde Kristen Rossum, a chemistry graduate from San Diego State University, could have had a brilliant future. Instead, she is serving a life sentence in the Central California Women's Facility for the crime against her husband. Ralph and Constance Rossum had three children and were preparing them for an undoubtedly bright future. The children received education from top schools, were tutored, and participated in clubs and sections for talent development. However, the fragile and impulsive Kristen broke, unable to keep up with the pace in pursuit of the ideal. Lying, skipping classes, and the desire to escape reality first introduced her to a sense of ease and oblivion after consuming alcohol. But soon, alcohol stopped providing the desired effect of tranquility, and she became dependent on the controlled substance methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, meth, is the most addictive illicit substance in the USA. It causes paranoia, clouds judgment, euphoria, and hallucinations. Kristen's erratic behavior and detachment from real life caught her parents' attention. After a long conversation, she admitted that she had been addicted to the substance since high school. This behavior was a severe blow for a family of university-educated professionals. After several months of numerous conflicts with her parents, 17-year-old Kristen secretly ran away to Mexico with friends for a holiday. There, she met a man by chance. Tall, handsome Gregory de Villers, seven years her senior, seemed like an angel who would save her. And he did. Greg fell in love with the bad girl. He took on the role of a parent and responsibility for her well-being. With Greg's support, she managed to get a job at a local forensic department as a toxicology assistant. Her skills impressed the employer. Her addiction was forgotten, which worked in her favor, as her job in toxicology provided access to seized controlled substances. As a forensic assistant, Kristen graduated from university with honors. Her teachers and employer praised her, handing her the best student award, unaware of the reasons for her love of the chosen profession. Her relationship with Greg lasted about five years and ended with a grand wedding on June 5, 1999. Kristen's parents adored Greg and were at ease for their daughter as she had climbed out of the pit of dependency and confidently stood on the road to a promising and happy life. In March 2000, Kristen was hired by the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office as a toxicologist. A toxicologist analyzes body fluids to detect controlled substances Gregory was working in the biotechnology industry at the time. Kristen quickly grew bored with her monotonous life and began seeking excitement elsewhere. She found an opportunity with a new colleague, Michael Robertson, who had been appointed as the department head. He was married, but that didn't stop a sudden infatuation between them. They couldn't keep their relationship secret for long. Greg found numerous letters exchanged between the secret lovers. The marital relationship deteriorated but Gregory still hoped to save the marriage, knowing his wife's weaknesses and trying as hard as ever to save her. This time, Kristen didn't want to be saved. She demanded a divorce. On the morning of Monday, November 6, 2000, Kristen was getting ready for work as usual. Greg was ill and stayed home. Kristen was very worried about her husband. In the days following their separation talk, he had been lethargic and unusually calm. She informed his workplace of her husband's illness. She also visited him during her lunch break. Greg was asleep. At 9.22 p.m. that same day, Christine called emergency services to report that her husband Greg was not breathing. He had most likely committed suicide because he was home alone. The woman cried into the phone and did not listen to the dispatcher's instructions to examine the body and possibly administer first aid. Police officers and paramedics arriving on the scene at 10.19 p.m. pronounced Gregory de Villiers dead. He was lying on the bedroom floor with his torso exposed, surrounded by scattered rose petals. The room examination suggested that Greg most likely consumed a lethal dose of several controlled substances. Empty vials of powerful painkillers were scattered around, and torn wedding photos were found on his bed. During the interrogation, Kristen stated that she had informed her husband of their separation the previous evening. Just 17 months after the wedding, she regretted getting married. She felt she had rushed into it, Greg was too clingy, and she wanted to distance herself. Greg's death was ruled a suicide. The cause of death was strong sedative drugs. Kristen signed the cremation papers, 
However, Gregory's family and friends refused to believe in such a sudden suicide. None of them noticed any changes in his character or mood. He had not shared his marital problems with anyone. Greg was so opposed to controlled substances that he would never have taken them. Soon, the relatives managed to stop the cremation and insisted on an independent autopsy. The family's persistence allowed for the consideration of a homicide scenario. Soon, toxicological tests revealed that Gregory's body contained an extremely high amount of feminal, a pain reliever 150 times stronger than morphine, along with lesser amounts of clonazepam and trace amounts of oxycodone, known as hillbilly heroin. Investigators speculated that, under the strong influence of clonazepam and other detected drugs, someone else administered the lethal dose of fentanyl to Gregory. Kristen became the prime suspect, as fentanyl is not an over-the-counter medication, and she had ample knowledge and access to such drugs. Upon arrival for interrogation at the police station, Kristen's emaciated, unattractive appearance and her doping behavior indicated her drug dependency. This was confirmed by her own statements on the day of Gregory's death. Kristen was inconsistent in her accounts. Initially, Kristen told paramedics that Gregory had not taken any medication, but later she changed her statement, suggesting he might have taken oxycodone. At the hospital, Kristen told a nurse that Gregory might have overdosed on oxycodone. Oxycodone is similar in effect to codeine-based drugs. It can not only relieve pain, but also induce a sense of euphoria. It depresses the respiratory center, and without timely assistance, its use can be fatal. The police considered the possibility that Gregory died from an accidental overdose of cold medicine and oxycodone. In conversations with Kristen, they also learned that Gregory was very upset about their failing marriage, leading Kristen to tell the police that he ended his own life. This was another investigative avenue they explored. On November 8th, a colleague of Kristen's, Russ Lowe, called the police. He informed them about Kristen's affair with her boss. This information shifted the course of the police investigation. Evidence of Kristen's connection with her boss, Dr. Robertson, was found. The evidence included passionate emails they exchanged, as well as computer files and professional articles revealing Dr. Robertson's specialized knowledge of fentanyl. The criminal puzzle was coming together perfectly. It was suspected that Gregory became a threat to the lovers, as he knew that Kristen, with her access to the lab and controlled substances, was secretly using them, and Michael was covering for her. It was a premeditated crime. The challenge for the investigators was to prove it. During interrogation, Michael Robertson told detectives that he was aware of his lover's drug dependency. At that time, no charges were brought against the couple. They were both dismissed from their jobs for violating several rules during the investigation. Serious trouble for Kristen began in January when police raided her home, finding traces of drugs and paraphernalia. She was arrested for the first time, but was later released on bail. The investigation progressed as new information emerged. This included Kristen's diary. During its initial examination, investigators hypothesized that it was written by Kristen not for herself, but for an external reader as a means of covering up and affirming her innocence while crafting the appearance of Gregory's perfect self-inflicted demise. On the day of her husband's death, she bought a rose in revealing lingerie actions inconsistent with her distressed demeanor. Medical examination indicated that Gregory was unconscious for at least six hours before his passing, and his death could have occurred an hour or an hour and a half before it was confirmed. Additionally, a bruise around a needle injection site on the young man's arm was found, its purpose and executor unexplained. At Kristen's workplace, a shortage of the drug that led to Gregory's demise as well as other controlled substances, was discovered. Police believed Kristen poisoned Gregory, administering fentanyl without his knowledge. The prosecution built its case on toxicological and medical data. With enough circumstantial evidence, Christine was arrested on June 25, 2001, and charged with first-degree murder. After spending six months in custody, she was released on bail. The first trial soon commenced. The prosecution's main theory was the motive for the homicide. They argued that she terminated Gregory because he threatened to tarnish her good girl reputation by revealing her renewed drug use and affair with Michael Robertson. The prosecution claimed Kristen poisoned Gregory with fentanyl, 
The court heard that fentanyl is a powerful synthetic opioid, 80 times stronger than morphine. It was suggested that she first tried to end his life with clonazepam, but when that failed, she administered fentanyl. They also argued that she then staged the bedroom to look like Gregory ended his own life, tearing pages from her diary and placing rose petals and a wedding photo around his body. The court heard that Kristen, with a degree in biochemistry, used her knowledge of drugs and chemistry to terminate Gregory. The prosecution also claimed that Kristen hoped to convince her colleagues in the medical examiner's office that Gregory's death was self-inflicted, hiding information about the fentanyl. However, before Gregory's autopsy could be conducted, she was transferred to another lab, and the attempt to substitute toxicological research was unsuccessful. The prosecution presented Kristen's day on November 6th. Early in the morning, she called Gregory's employer to report his absence, then went to work. Her colleagues testified that about an hour after she arrived at work, around 9 a.m., she was seen crying in Michael's office. The apartment building manager, where Kristen and Gregory lived, reported seeing her return home at 12.10 p.m. At 12.41 p.m., she went to a local grocery store and purchased several items, including a single red rose. Credit card statements confirm this fact. Hours before Gregory's demise, she made multiple calls to Michael. Dr. Brian Blackburn, the San Diego County medical examiner who conducted Gregory's autopsy, testified that Gregory had been deceased for at least an hour before the paramedics arrived. He informed the court that Gregory developed early bronchop pneumonia. This condition arises when secretions, normally expelled through breathing, accumulate in the lungs because a person is either unconscious or not breathing deeply enough. Dr. Blackburn also informed the court that Gregory's bladder contained a significant amount of urine, which would have been very uncomfortable had he been conscious. This led Dr. Blackburn to conclude that Gregory was breathing poorly for approximately 6 to 12 hours before his death. A person in an unconscious state would not be able to sprinkle rose petals over themselves. Dr. Blackburn showed that the level of clonazepam found in Gregory's blood was not at an overdose level and was not lethal. Dr. Theodore Stanley testified on behalf of the prosecution. He demonstrated that fentanyl is a potent and fast-acting pain reliever with a serious side effect that can lead to a person's respiratory arrest. Dr. Stanley stated that the speed at which fentanyl begins to act depends on the method of its administration. The peak effect occurs about 16 hours after applying a transdermal patch, 20 to 30 minutes after oral ingestion, 15 to 20 minutes after intramuscular injection, and within five minutes after intravenous injection. Dr. Stanley informed the court that fentanyl is usually not administered orally because the liver destroys about 65% of it, so only 35% enters the bloodstream. When asked to explain how fentanyl entered Gregory's system, neither Dr. Blackburn nor Dr. Stanley could provide a definitive opinion. Dr. Stanley showed that various concentration levels in Gregory's body, along with data indicating that Gregory was unconscious and breathing shallowly for several hours before his death, suggest that fentanyl was likely administered to Gregory multiple times. The prosecution could not confidently tell the jury how Kristen poisoned Gregory, but there were indications that she might have applied fentanyl patches to his arm while he was asleep. The disappearance of 15 patches from the laboratory where Kristen formerly worked supported this theory as a possibility. The defense asserted Kristen's innocence, acknowledging that fentanyl was the cause of Gregory's death, but claimed he self-administered it, intentionally causing his own demise due to despair over family issues. Kristen testified in court, describing waking up on the morning of November 6th to find Gregory distraught. She called his employer at 7.42 a.m. to report his illness and that he wouldn't be coming to work. She told the court she went to work but returned to the apartment to check on Gregory, having lunch with him after noon. Christine's testimony. I asked Gregory why he was so upset that morning. He replied that he wasn't feeling well and had taken some oxycodone and clonazepam. He planned to stay home and sleep. I left for work. Around 2.30 in the afternoon during my lunch break, I came home to check on Gregory. We had lunch. I then went back to work. I got home around 8 o'clock in the evening. Gregory was lying on the bed. I thought he was asleep. I took a bath. When I came out, I tried to wake him up. He was cold. I called the emergency services. The prosecutor cross-examined Kristen, calling her explanation strange. 
She admitted to lying in the past and about her drug use. He told the court that fentanyl was the perfect poison because it's hard to detect, which she knew well from her job. Medical testimony based on autopsy and toxicological findings proved that Gregory was unconscious for about six, eight hours, meaning Kristen couldn't have had lunch with her husband that day. The defense claimed that although Dr. Blackborn showed the clonazepam level in Gregory's blood wasn't lethal, taking oxycodone, an opioid, and clonazepam, a benzodiazepine, together could create a synergistic effect, making them more potent. They suggested Gregory might have unknowingly taken the drugs himself. How fentanyl was administered and why high levels were found in his system remained unexplained. After eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Kristen guilty of first-degree homicide and special circumstances homicide due to the use of poison. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Kristen maintained her innocence and appealed the verdict. The appellate court heard that errors were made by her own defense team. Her lawyers admitted fentanyl caused the death but failed to test autopsy samples for fentanyl metabolites. This test could have determined whether Gregory swallowed fentanyl or if the fentanyl found in the samples was a result of laboratory contamination after his death. If fentanyl had been detected only in the samples and never in Gregory's body, the prosecution's theory that fentanyl caused his death would have been incorrect. The appellate court heard that there was a break in the chain of custody regarding the samples. They were placed in a cardboard box, with each container marked as a sample from Gregory's body, but the containers weren't sealed. They were supposed to be delivered to the sheriff's office for immediate transfer to an external lab, but the person supposed to receive the samples was absent, so the box remained at the medical examiner's office for about 36 hours before being delivered to the sheriff's forensic lab. The appellate court's argument was that anyone with a key to the medical examiner's office building had access to the samples. Fentanyl could have been added to the samples posthumously. Kristen believed there was a motive to tamper with the samples and frame her for the crime due to various personal relationships and tensions among the staff. Indeed, Kristen argued in the appellate court that on November 8, 2000, Michael informed one of the toxicologists that he had examined a sample of Gregory's stomach contents. The three-judge panel of the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals concluded that Kristen's lawyers erred in not contesting the prosecution's claim that her husband died from a fentanyl overdose. They stated that her legal team should have tested the autopsy samples for fentanyl metabolites, rather than just admitting he died in such a manner. However, they did not overturn the verdict, but sent the case back to federal court to determine if this defense error could have altered the trial's outcome. After this decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that federal courts must adhere to the state court's decision when considering such appeals. Based on this ruling, the appellate court voted against holding a hearing on Kristen's case. Her appeal was denied, and she remains in custody. Michael Robertson was implicated as an accomplice in Kristen's trial. Authorities discreetly filed a criminal conspiracy complaint and issued a sealed warrant for the arrest of Michael Robertson, the former boss and lover of convicted perpetrator Kristen Rossum. Robertson, who lives freely and works as a forensic toxicology consultant in Australia since Rossum's husband's demise in 2000, could be arrested and held on $100,000 bail if he ever returns to the United States. Gregory's family filed a lawsuit accusing the county of negligence that allowed Kristen to steal a lethal dose of drugs from the medical examiner's office undetected. In 2006, a U.S. court awarded them $147 million in civil damages. In a case that continues to captivate the nation, Rossum, a former toxicologist at the county medical examiner's office, was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole in February 2003 for stealing drugs from the lab and using them to poison her husband, Gregory de Villers, staging a suicide scene in their apartment, scattering his body with red rose petals. Years have passed since Alyssa Burkett's life was tragically cut short. Her daughter Willow has grown up in a loving family, surrounded by the care of her grandparents. Each year on Alyssa's birthday, they visit her grave, remembering her beauty, kindness, and boundless love. The memory of Alyssa lives on in the hearts of her loved ones, in every beat of little Willow's heart. 
and while the pain of loss will never fade, they know Alyssa will always be with them in their thoughts, actions, and hopes for a better future. Her story is a sad but important reminder of how fragile life is and how important it is to appreciate loved ones while they are close by. Alyssa Ann Burkett was born on the 31st of December, 1995 in Mesquite, Texas, to Teresa Ann Burkett and Joshua Forsyth. She had three sisters, Nikki, Madison, and Taylor, and two brothers, Landon and Tyler. From a young age, Alyssa displayed creative inclinations. At the age of seven, she dreamed of becoming a fashion designer and crafting her own clothing. She enthusiastically sketched designs for future outfits. Her grandfather, Russell Forsyth, a songwriter, encouraged his granddaughter's passion and hoped she would continue his legacy. However, at the age of 13, Alyssa changed her plans and decided to pursue a career in law. She explained to her grandfather that she enjoyed arguing and felt a calling in it. Russell supported his granddaughter's choice, albeit mourning about the necessity of diligent study on this path. After graduating from Roy City High School, Alyssa enrolled in a local college. At 18, she discovered she was expecting a child with her boyfriend, Andrew Bird, who was nine years her senior. This unplanned pregnancy caught Alyssa off guard and compelled her to reassess her life plans. Alyssa parted ways with Andrew, deciding to raise her daughter on her own. She dropped out of college and dedicated herself entirely to motherhood. On the 31st of December, 2019, her 24th birthday, Alyssa gave birth to a healthy baby girl whom she named Willow. Despite the challenges, Alyssa strived to be an exemplary mother. Her relatives noted that she wanted to provide her daughter with a stable and loving family, a privilege she was deprived of in her own childhood due to her parents' divorce. On her social media platforms, Alyssa appeared vivacious and open. She shared family photos, thoughts, and interests. Those close to her described her as straightforward, energetic, with a heart of gold and a radiant smile. Alyssa worked tirelessly to provide for her daughter. She was an assistant at a real estate firm and an employee at a management company. At the time of her demise, she was working at Green Tree, a residential real estate company. She was stubborn, determined, sometimes selfish, but you couldn't stay mad at her for long. She had eternal beauty and charm, reminisced her grandfather Russell. He and the entire family were devastated when Alyssa's life tragically ended at the age of 24. Alyssa Burkett met Andrew Bird in her teenage years. He was nine years her senior and appeared as a mysterious bad boy. Despite the protests of her relatives, Alyssa began to court him. The relationship was unstable and complex. Bird did not work and relied on Alyssa for support, yet he was possessive, causing scenes and monitoring every move of the young woman. Friends advised her to break up with him multiple times, but she always returned. In January 2019, 23-year-old Alyssa discovered she was pregnant with Bird's child. She decided to keep the baby, although she doubted Andrew as a future father. Eventually, she left him, choosing to raise her daughter on her own. On December 31st, 2019, Alyssa gave birth to a girl named Willow, with the help of her family, especially her grandparents, she tried to provide her daughter with a peaceful childhood and kept Baird away, deeming him unreliable. However, Baird was unwilling to back down. He initiated a fierce legal battle for custody of Willow, declaring he would achieve his goal at any cost, stating that nothing will stop him. Alyssa feared retaliation from his side. In April 2020, just four months after Willow's birth, a new woman entered Andrew's life, 22-year-old Holly Elkins. Elkins quickly moved in with Bird and began making plans for their life together and raising his daughter. The appearance of the young stepmother only intensified the conflict. Elkins saw Alyssa as a rival and actively sought to eliminate her from Bird's life. She positioned herself as the perfect mother for Willow. Alyssa felt a growing threat from her ex-boyfriend and his fiance GC. Friends advised her to be cautious and wary of the worst. Little did she know that her life would soon be cut short by their hands. Shortly after Andrew Bird and Holly Elkins started their relationship, they launched a full-scale campaign to persecute Alyssa Burkett. 
Their aim was to completely destroy her reputation and strip her of parental rights to gain full custody of Bird's daughter, Willow. In her messages, Elkins openly expressed her obsession with removing Alyssa as a mother. She wrote to Bird that Alyssa controls him, puts him first, and that he must show his submission to his ex and deal with this mess. Elkins insulted Alyssa, calling her a liar, stupid, and a bad mom. She instigated Bird, claiming that Alyssa stood in the way of their happy family life with Willow and urged him to take radical actions. One instance of slander was not enough for Elkins. Together with Bird, they installed a GPS tracker on Alyssa's car, monitoring her every move. Elkins then anonymously called 911, falsely reporting Alyssa for allegedly driving erratically, trying to discredit her to the police. Another time, Elkins went to the police and falsely accused Alyssa's mother of attacking her. To corroborate her story, she even deliberately scratched her own chest. The couple hired a private detective to find dirt on Alyssa and her new partner. Although the investigator found nothing incriminating, Bird and Elkins persisted. In September 2020, they themselves planted drugs and unregistered weapons in Alyssa's car and anonymously informed the police that Alyssa was allegedly dealing drugs from her trunk. During questioning, Alyssa tearfully insisted she had no involvement with drugs. She immediately suspected Bird's involvement trying to tarnish her in the eyes of child services and the police. Unfortunately, she couldn't prove it. The persecution took on an increasingly menacing tone. A week before the murder, Elkins wrote to Bird, I hope you can handle this. She demanded that he go or die for her, clearly hinting of the impending crime. Unbeknownst to herself, Alyssa was in mortal danger. She had only a few days left to live, Following direct instructions from his fiance GCE Holly Elkins, Andrew Bird began the direct preparation for the murder of Alyssa Burkett. They acted deliberately and methodically, planning every detail of the crime. On September 10th, 2020, just three weeks before the tragedy, Elkins accompanied Bird to a sporting goods store. There, he purchased a black raincoat in cash, which he would later use in the attack. Elkins clearly assisted him in selecting suitable attire for the crime. On September 14th, they visited a pharmacy, where Elkins bought dark foundation and other cosmetics for makeup. Evidently, she planned to disguise Bird to hinder his identification by witnesses. Later, the police would find this makeup in Bird's car, along with wipes containing traces of makeup. On September 19th, the couple visited a hardware store, where they bought shotgun shells and a large Camillus knife. It was this shotgun and knife that Bird would soon use to carry out his vengeance on the mother of his daughter. Over the past week of September, Elkins inundated Bird with messages, goading him to put the plan into action. She wrote that they needed to deal with this, go or die. Elkins explicitly stated that their relationship would be at risk if he did not follow through to the end. Receiving a clear signal, Bird got down to business. The search history on his phone shows that he began looking for information on how to remove gunpowder residue from his hands after a shot. He clearly did not want to leave any traces. Six days before the attack, Bird bought a used black Ford Expedition advertised. He planned to use it for surveillance on Alyssa and his transportation to the crime scene. The seller later identified Bird as the buyer. A day before the attack, Bird attached a homemade silencer to his .22 caliber pistol. Although he ultimately did not use it in the attack, the mere fact of making the silencer demonstrates the purposefulness of his actions. Finally, on the morning of October 2nd, Bird disguised himself as an African American, donned a black raincoat, and headed to Alyssa's house in a parked SUV nearby. Thanks to Elkins's messages, he knew the victim's daily routine and could anticipate where to find her. The plan was set. Bird and Elkins had considered all the details. They were prepared to ruthlessly execute the mother of one and a half year old Willow in broad daylight. There was no turning back. On the morning of October 2nd, 2020, nothing foreshadowed the tragedy. 24 year old Alyssa Bouquet, as usual, dropped off her one and a half year old daughter Willow at her grandmother's and headed to work at the Green Tree Homes Management Company in Carrollton. 
she parked her car in front of the office around 9 a.m. and was about to enter the building. At that moment, a black SUV sped towards her car at full speed. A man in a black cloak with a hood and a mask covering his face jumped out of it. In his hands, he held a short-barreled shotgun. Without giving Alyssa time to react, the attacker approached closely and shot her in the head through the side window. Alyssa slumped over the steering wheel, her face and hair drenched in blood. The killer rushed back to his car, intending to flee. However, at that moment, although fatally wounded, Alyssa managed to open the door and almost fall out of the car onto the asphalt. With some incredible force of will, she crawled towards the office door, trying to call for help. A bloody trail followed her. Noticing the movement, Bird swiftly turned around. He pulled out a large hunting knife from under his cloak and lunged towards Alyssa writhing on the ground. Grabbing her by the hair, he viciously began stabbing her in the neck, chest, and abdomen. In total, Bird inflicted no fewer than 13 stab wounds. From the injuries sustained, Alyssa died on the spot. When her colleagues, hearing the screams, rushed out to the parking lot, they found Alyssa in a pool of blood, her throat slashed. They tried to perform CPR, but in vain. By that time, Bird had already fled in his black SUV, leaving the bloodied knife on the parking lot. Random witnesses described the assailant as a tall, muscular man dressed in all black, with a mask or hood on his head. Many mistook him for an African-American. At the time of the attack, Holly Elkins, according to her own words, was at home with Bird's daughter, Willow. Thus, she had an alibi. Later, she told the police that Bird allegedly was with her all this time, which turned out to be a lie. The brutal daylight murder in a crowded place shocked the residents of Carrollton. They were puzzled about the motives of the criminal. However, Alyssa's relatives and friends immediately suspected Andrew Bird. They were aware of the protracted conflict between the former partners and feared the worst. Alyssa's mother, barely holding back tears, informed the police of her suspicions regarding Baird. She recounted his threats and obsession with her daughter, the prolonged legal battle for custody of her granddaughter. According to her, Baird had repeatedly stated that the living Alyssa Willow would not get. Thus began one of the most shocking and resonant trials in the history of Texas, a trial that made local residents rethink, seemingly, the familiar issue of domestic violence and stalking. The name of Alyssa Burkett will long be remembered as a symbol of maternal love and resilience in the face of cruelty. The investigation into Alyssa Burkett's murder began with questioning witnesses of the crime scene. Alyssa's colleagues detailed the appearance and actions of the assailant. Although he wore a mask, his tall stature and muscular build stood out. Some mistakenly took him for an African-American. The testimonies of Alyssa's relatives about the prolonged conflict with her former partner, Andrew Bird, immediately made him the prime suspect. Friends and colleagues of Alyssa spoke of his obsession, constant surveillance, and threats. Alyssa's new boyfriend recalled that Bird mentioned their full home addresses, although they had not disclosed this information to him. Detectives began surveillance of Bird's house in Rowlett. Soon they noticed Bird, accompanied by his fiancée GCE Holly Elkins and daughter Willow, carrying suitcases and bags out of the house, clearly preparing to leave for a long time. When Bird got into the car, the police stopped him on the pretext of lacking a license plate. During the search of the car, men's boots cut into pieces and soaked in bleach were found. Also discovered were remnants of camouflage makeup, napkins with makeup, and burnt parts of a brush for its application. In Baird's house, detectives found even more evidence primarily batteries for GPS trackers that the criminal attached to the cars of Alyssa and her boyfriend. There was also a homemade silencer for a pistol and a whole arsenal of weapons. But the main discovery was a written script that Bird used when calling the police to report drugs in Alyssa's car. The police seized three phones from Baird, including a disposable one. In the search history of one of them, there were inquiries on how to remove gunpowder residue from hands. He was clearly trying to cover his tracks. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the city, an abandoned black Ford Expedition SUV was discovered. In the cabin, forensic experts found Alyssa's blood and fibers of a fake beard with Andrew's DNA. The car seller identified Bird as the buyer and remembered that he paid in cash and was in a hurry. 
Forensic examination revealed that the bullet that killed Alyssa was fired from the sawed-off shotgun found in the car. Bird's fingerprints were also found on the handle of a hunting knife. His handwriting was clearly identifiable in the GPS devices and in the calls with false accusations. It seemed that the prosecution had gathered comprehensive evidence of Andrew Bird's guilt. However, the prosecutors also aimed to hold his accomplice, Holly Elkins, accountable. Electronic correspondence between them came to the rescue, showing Elkins' role in planning and inciting the crime. The investigation lasted for several months. During this time, the prosecution meticulously assembled a mosaic of evidence, unequivocally incriminating the ruthless killers of Alyssa Burkett. The jurors were shocked by the cynicism and calculated nature of the criminals. They eagerly awaited the start of the trial to deliver a just verdict. The trial for the murder of Alyssa Burkett began in June 2022, almost two years after the tragedy. Sitting in the dock were 35-year-old Andrew Bird and his 23-year-old fiancée Gukka, Holly Elkins. They were charged with stalking, conspiracy, and first-degree murder. From the outset, the prosecutors made it clear that they intended to seek the maximum punishment for both defendants. In their opening statement, they painted a picture for the jurors of a massive conspiracy to take the life of a young mother. The correspondence between Baird and Elkins left no doubt about the meticulous planning of the crime. A key prosecution witness was Christopher Mayo, Alyssa's boyfriend at the time of her death. He told the jurors about months of harassment and persecution orchestrated by Byrd and Elkins against them. According to him, Alyssa had mentioned multiple times that Baird seemed like someone capable of killing her. Mayo recounted the phone threats, constant surveillance, and attempts to discredit Alyssa in the eyes of social services and the police. He stated that Elkins was the public master, directing Bird's actions. Her pathological jealousy and obsession with another's child ultimately led to the tragedy. Colleagues and friends of Alyssa shared the grief of the slain mother. Alyssa had confided in them, expressing fear of her unstable ex, feeling constantly watched. A few days before her death, she told a friend, if something happens to me, know that Andrew did it. Forensic experts presented the jurors with a rich arsenal of physical evidence, unequivocally linking Bird to the crime scene. In addition to DNA and fingerprints on the murder weapons, there were traces of gunpowder and disguise fragments in his house and car. However, the nail in the coffin of the trial was the electronic correspondence between Baird and Elkins, eloquently demonstrating their joint plans. Phrases like, I hope you can handle this, do it or die for me. This B asterisk, teach must disappear, littered their messages in the days leading up to the murder. Bird's defense attempted to argue for the lack of premeditation in his actions. Supposedly, he only intended to scare his ex, but in a fit of rage, miscalculated his force. The defense emphasized the emotional distress and stress from the prolonged legal battle but the correspondence in meticulous preparation for the crime completely refuted these speculations. Particularly telling were Byrd's internet searches on removing gunpowder traces. Such actions do not align with those of someone who accidentally turned to violence. Elkins outright denied her involvement, citing an alibi. However, even here, her position was woven with white lies. Messages where she urged her partner to deal with the rival literally put a nail in the coffin of her innocence, at least in incitement. In the end, Byrd admitted guilt on the main points. Apparently, he decided to mitigate his fate, avoiding a life sentence. He detailed, albeit quite impassively, the circumstances of the murder, his preparation and motives. His key motive was an obsession with Willow, his daughter. Elkins stood her ground to the end. Even after the guilty verdict, she continued to proclaim her innocence and the injustice of the sentence. However, this did not help her escape a harsh punishment. In May 2023, the judge pronounced the verdict. Andrew Byrd received 43 years in prison, effectively a life sentence. Holly Elkins was sentenced to 20 years for complicity. The courtroom erupted in applause. Justice, albeit delayed, prevailed. The killers of Alyssa Burkett received their due. The loved ones of Alice, with tears in their eyes, expressed gratitude to the prosecutors and jurors. 
Nothing will bring back our girl. But we are thankful that the guilty have been punished, and no one else will suffer at their hands," said Alice's mother to the journalists. This tragedy will serve as a bitter lesson for all victims of domestic violence for a long time. The untimely and cruel death of Alice Burkett shook the residents of Texas in the entire America. A young mother, beloved daughter and sister, she was killed in the most despicable and inhumane manner by the hands of her former partner and the father of her child. Her story became a tragic symbol of the epidemic of domestic violence, claiming thousands of lives annually. Despite the just verdict for the killers, Alice's family does not hide. Their loss is irreplaceable. She was a ray of light in our lives, recalls her mother Teresa, determined, with a huge loving heart. She lived for her daughter and dreamed of giving her the best. Most painful was the fact that Alice sensed the danger and repeatedly reported it to her loved ones and the police. Alas, no one took her words seriously until it was too late. Perhaps more decisive intervention could have prevented the tragedy. She told me, Mom, he will kill me, I know. But what could I do? The police shrugged, saying, until he does something, we are powerless. Alice's Aunt Shelley shares in tears. Particular concern arises for Alice's daughter, two-year-old Willow. She lost her mother at such a tender age and will surely not fully grasp the extent of her loss for a long time. Custody of the girl was granted to her maternal grandparents. They vowed to do everything to ensure Willow grows up in love and never forgets her mother. Every day I show her photos of Alice, tell her how wonderful she was. Willow is still young, but she already reaches for the pictures, caressing them with her finger. Despite everything, we will continue to live on, for her, says Alice's grandmother, Teresa Ann. Alice's story raises uncomfortable yet critically important questions. Why do signals of domestic violence victims often go unnoticed? How can we improve the protection and response system to complaints? What prevents us all from being more vigilant about the problems of friends and family? Experts urge early recognition of warning signs of abusive relationships, pathological jealousy, control, isolation from friends and family, outbursts of aggression. Victims need to know they are not alone and can seek help at any time by contacting hotlines or crisis centers. The most important thing is not to remain silent, not to tolerate, not to consider it normal. Violence is never acceptable, and it rarely stops on its own. Alice was strong, but even the strong sometimes need help, emphasizes psychologist Anna Byers, leading a support group for abuse survivors. Alice's death should not be in vain. Her case once again shows how important it is to take threats and signs of violence seriously, especially when the well-being of children is at stake. No family drama is worth a lost life. The name of Alice Burkett will forever remain in the memory of her loved ones and fellow citizens. Her photos and posts on social media continue to gather likes, comments and words of support even years after the tragedy. Many see in her an example of resilience and dedication to loved ones despite all trials. Rest in peace, dear Alice. You will forever remain in our hearts. We will continue your work and love Willow as you loved her. Justice has prevailed, and now you can rest peacefully. We will always remember your goodness, wilt her grandfather Russell on the first anniversary of her death. Perhaps some day in the future, Willow will be able to read these words and learn what an amazing woman her mother was. A woman who fought for her until her last breath and did not let her love fade even in the face of monstrous cruelty. Her short but bright life will forever be an example for all mothers. Alice Burkett's story is not just another criminal chronicle. It is a tragedy of a young woman who only wanted one thing, to love and raise her daughter, but her life was cut short by those who vowed to protect her. Her child's father and his new partner. Obsession, jealousy, desire for control. These were the true motives driving Andrew Bird and Holly Elkins. Neither pleas from Alice, nor fear of the law, nor thoughts of the well-being of Little Willow stopped them. In pursuit of a sick passion, they crossed the final line. The most frightening thing is that Alice's case is just the tip of the iceberg. Hundreds of women across the country face domestic violence, harassment, and threats daily. Many are afraid to speak openly about it, considering their burden shameful. Unfortunately, 
the outcome of this silence can be fatal. Alice's example reminds us, we must not turn a blind eye to signs of abuse in our own lives or the lives of our loved ones. Pathological jealousy is not love, constant control is not care, and outbursts of aggression are not character. These are warning bells, SOS signals that cannot be ignored. If you have become a victim of domestic violence, know that you are not alone. There are people and organizations ready to lend a helping hand. Do not be afraid to take this step. Do not wait until the situation becomes deadly. Your safety and right to a life without fear are paramount above all other considerations. It is our collective responsibility to raise the younger generation in respect and acceptance, to teach them to resolve conflicts with words, not fists or guns, to explain that love does not tolerate violence. Perhaps then our daughters will no longer perish at the hands of those they once let into their hearts. I don't know if Willow will ever understand why and for what her mother died, but I know for sure Alice loved her more than life. Her last thoughts were surely about her daughter. And there, in the heavens, she continues to watch over her little one, said her brother Landon at her funeral. Someday Willow will grow up and be able to read this story herself, the story of her mother's life, love, and struggle. May the memory of Alice be a source of strength and faith in a better future for her. And for all of us, a bitter lesson, a reminder, and a call to action. We owe it to her. We owe it to each other.